everybody. Um, I'd like to thank Diabetes SA for asking us to come out and talk to you guys today. Um, it's always a good opportunity to, to, I guess, expose what we do as exercise physiologists and what we do as a business, and, and I guess how that benefits individuals, not just with diabetes, but with other comorbidities as well. So um, I'll apologise first and foremost, I'm returning from about three and a half weeks of leave after the birth of my second child. So I've had about three word conversations for the last three weeks. So if I get a little bit lost along the way or I'll quote the wiggles as we go, I do, I do apologise, but hey, it's all good fun. So today I guess we're gonna be talking about what an exercise physiologist actually is because it's one of the questions that when I do get referred patients is the first thing that they ask me. Why am I here and what do you do? Um, so we will go through that today. We'll have a look at some research. Um, again, most of my graphs will be for shock factor, um, showing the benefits of exercise on that diabetic control. Um, why we should be exercising. Um, and I think most people know that we should be exercising. They know that we should be moving. The biggest question is why aren't we? And what are the barriers in place as to why we're not meeting the recommendations? And I guess for other clients, it's where do we start? What should I be doing? What does exercise actually look like? And people's perception of what exercise is and how we can apply it in a practical sense can be two very different things. So I do create, uh, I, I take a good passion in, in diabetes management in trying to break down them barriers or preconceived notions in terms of what people think exercise is and what in reality it is that we can do to actually make a difference. And we'll go through some cautions, um, some diabetic cautions, things you need to look out for when you are exercising. Um, and then there'll be a bit of selfless promotion where we'll go through some of the services that we do provide at our clinic and I guess how you can gain access to some of them services. So our governing body, ESSA, the Exercise Sports Science Association, defines an exercise physiologist as somebody who'll match the immediate aspirations and needs of a client with appropriate exercise interventions in developing strategies that promote and assist ongoing management. Now, it's pretty wordy. Um, I'm not sure who came up with that term, but um, they seem to use a lot of big words to try to promote what we do. Basically, our role is to discuss an individual's health, try to determine what their medical concerns are, but going further than that, what are your actual goals? Because sometimes a doctor will refer a patient and what they want to get out of it is very, very different. So quite often I'll get a diabetic patient who doesn't even tell me they have diabetes, um, but they're more concerned about their management of their knee, and that knee is restricting their ability to move, which is having an impact on their diabetes. So quite often we can always work around as to how we can fit that diabetes management in, even if we're attenuating something else. So basically we, we spend four years at university um, having a look at the body systems, we look at the research um, and how that impacts um, an individual. Um, it, it focuses predominantly on physical activity, but marrying up them body systems. So how does our body work and how does exercise and activity have a positive influence on this and in some cases a negative influence. Um, we definitely look at behavioural sciences as well and motivation is definitely a big barrier towards exercise. So working out the reasonings as to why people are or are not achieving regular exercise is definitely something we spend every day doing. Um, in terms of diabetes, I would see a diabetic patient every single day for the last 10 years. Um, yesterday afternoon, my last five clients, four of them five clients, all had type 2 diabetes. So it's very, very prevalent and it's something that we deal with every day. Um, but as I said, quite often they come in with many, many medical issues. Um, so we'll quickly touch on some of the medical benefits of exercise. Now, if you have a quick think about where exercise can benefit, I'm sure you could all come up with a list of benefits or medical conditions that exercise could benefit. Um, and if we pop to the next page, and this is by no means every, every um, issue that we can work with, um, but it's quite an extensive list. Now this list can be twofold. Obviously these are the things that exercise can have significant benefit with, um, but they're also the things that we see a type 2 diabetic or a diabetic patient in general having one or more of these issues. So, you know, if we raised your hands now as to who had diabetes and more than one of these other conditions, um, I'm sure most of the room would probably put their hands up. So we're not always just dealing with diabetes on the surface. There are a number of other reasons as to why we need to be exercising and be active. 
and they all interrelate. So blood pressure, weight management, cholesterol, all tend to be things that are associated heavily with diabetes. We don't necessarily know which one's causing the other, but we know that they all tend to work within that same construct. In terms of diabetes specifically, it does put a lot of stress on our systems. So over time, uncontrolled type 2 diabetes can put pressure and cause other complications. So quite commonly, we see our eye system. So we, we often see people with retinopathy and issues. And retinopathy is one of the leading causes of blindness in, in individuals under the age of 60. So uncontrolled diabetes can be quite a serious concern. Um, on the renal system or the kidney system, so having this high concentration of blood sugar levels, potentially associating that with hypertension at the same time, causes our kidneys to work much, much harder than we desire, and that can lead to varying levels of kidney failure. Um, unfortunately, the leading cause of death for a diabetic is actually renal failure. Um, so it's quite a significant issue, and once we start eliciting these symptoms, we can't actually reverse. So if you're in stage one or two or three of renal failure, we can't actually backtrack from there. All we can try to do is try to prevent that conditioning from worsening, and ideally speaking, if we see you early enough, we try to prevent that from occurring altogether. And that's probably one of the reasons I am relatively passionate about diabetes. When I get a newly diagnosed type 2 diabetic, I'm aware that if we can get them lifestyle changes and interventions in early enough, we can actually modify and reduce the risk factors for some of these things occurring. So that's probably one of the most important factors. Um, other issues, we do see approximately a six time increase in the risk of heart failure or, or a heart attack if you are a type two diabetic. Um, so quite often these risks are, are really, really apparent. So what do we do about it is probably the main thing. So this study here had a look at what we could do if we see a reduction in diabetic control or improvement in diabetic control. So everybody here would probably be familiar with the HbA1c testing protocols, normally do it every three to six months, and it measures a protein marker in the blood system um, that is sensitive to blood sugar. The higher your blood sugar concentration, the higher this percentage is going to be. Now, a very well-controlled diabetic might come to me at 5, 5.5, but that's very rare. You know, it's not uncommon to see numbers well above 7, which is the recommendation is to be below 7, but I see clients 8s, 9s, 10s, 11s and beyond. So this study went through, if we can reduce that test result by 1%, so not 1% out of 100, but a 1% point, so if you were an 8 down to a 7% on your HbA1c, we actually see significant reductions in um, some of these comorbidities occurring, and some of them are quite significant. So peripheral vac vascular disease, approximately 40% reduction if we can get a 1% reduction point in your HbA1c. Um, myocardial infarction, stroke, heart failure, um, again, 15 to 20%. So these are all big numbers. If we can reduce your risk by 15 to 20%, then we're working towards some good benefits there. Importantly, how do we go about it? So currently, um, we look at a multidisciplinary approach to diabetic care. So your first protocol is typically going to be a medical practitioner in order to diagnose it and determine as to whether you require medication and things like that. And that's normally where it starts. The GP may decide as to whether you need to go on to medication immediately or whether lifestyle intervention is going to be appropriate in this case. Um, that's where you might see myself in terms of exercise physiology or you might see a dietitian, um, even a diabetes educator, to improve your understanding of how diabetes works and to try to reduce the blood sugars prior to medication or at least help their medications work more effectively. Um, if, quite often if we don't access all of these, we don't see great success. So quite often that client that's been under their GP for 20 years, and their GP may have thrown the idea that you should be exercising or do this, but no one has accessed these systems, we tend to find that it's a fairly slippery slope in terms of that diabetic control. Quite often we go from oral hypoglycemics to increasing that dosage by two or three times, potentially onto insulin. So we see a pathway of increasing medications, but the blood sugar control isn't necessarily improving. It's either staying steady or it's continually getting worse. So not really winning the battle in that sense. So we definitely need to do a little bit more about it. 
So why should we, why should we be exercising um, in, in regards to diabetes management? Um, and I guess I put that picture up because age isn't a limit. This gentleman was well into his 90s and he was still attending our clinic twice a week um, and still maintaining good benefits associated with this. So in terms of specific benefits from a diabetic perspective, sugar, uh, reductions in blood sugar levels is obviously the first and foremost. So our first talk and our second talk today, our third talk today, are going to be talking about how to reduce that sugar intake or things going into the system. Our job as exercise physiologists is to get it out of the system once it's already there. Okay, so we need to get people moving and that exercise is very beneficial in bringing their blood sugars down. And in many cases, it's as effective as your medication. So it's quite powerful in, in, in how it works. Um, obviously improving fun function and fitness. Quite often my clients come to me very deconditioned, quite concerned about exercise. Often they come into my gym setting and walk into my office and, and they start to panic about why, why am I in a clinic setting? Why am I at a gym? What has my doctor done to me? And we tend to spend that first session trying to just break down them barriers as to we do have that facility available, but there's heaps of things we can do at home that are going to have a positive influence as well. Weight management is definitely important. Um, we know that reductions in weight are going to have a significant improvement on your diabetic control as well. Reducing blood pressure, improving your cholesterol levels, potentially having a benefit on reducing um, heart attacks moving forward, which is very important. Mental health is probably a very understated concern, and, and many people that do have diabetes will suffer from mental health concerns as well, so depression, anxiety, feelings of helplessness and not being in control of their condition. And exercise is definitely a way where we can start to empower our clients into taking control of their diabetes rather than waiting for the GP or that medical practitioner to increase that dosage, giving you ways and strategies to help reduce your sugars. Confidence and self-esteem as well. I was chatting to a gentleman earlier today um, who'd suffered an injury, didn't really know where to start his exercise, coming to us and having a chat has sort of put him back on a pathway now of exercise can be quite manageable. It wasn't what I thought you would get me to do, but it was very manageable and I'm already noticing an improvement. So that gentleman I hope will continue to, to make improvements with his um, fix, fitness and function and his confidence and we should see good improvements with that. So I guess when we look at exercise, we need to separate some of the acute benefits of exercise and the chronic long-term benefits that we get associated with exercise. So when we go for a walk or do any form of exercise, we're actually getting our muscles active. So that's the first port of call. So I like to use the analogy of a car. So when we eat, we bring fuel into the system, but if we leave that car parked under the garage from then, the fuel's not going anywhere. So it's gonna to continue to sit in that system until we go for a drive. If we need to drive that car once a week, that fuel is going to last a long time. The difference between the analogy of the car is that then we have lunch. So we're adding more fuel again, and then we have dinner, and then that cycle continues. So if we're not forcing that system to actually utilise the sugars that are in our blood system, we're going to run into significant difficulties in that respect. So the muscle starts utilising that stored glucose once we start moving, okay? Now, quite often in the diabetics case, particularly type 2, we see an issue where insulin is trying to do its job. So often we see blood sugar levels for a fasted individual between four and six, okay? Diabetics might be a little bit higher than that. But after we eat, we shouldn't see sugar levels raise more than that eight millimole level, and we quite often see much, much higher levels than that. And that's where we get that breakdown in that system. So insulin at that point is released. It then binds with the muscle to get rid of this excess sugar. If the sugar is, is full in the muscle system, it just gets rid of it. It just burns it off as heat. Now, when there is a breakdown in that system, that communication's not there. So the blood sugar levels continue to rise and the muscles are a little bit lazy and don't really want to do their job at the same time. So if we force that system like anything, whenever you have a problem, if we actually communicate about our problems and actually get both parties to talk about what's going on, we get improvements. So once the muscle starts talking to that insulin system and they start binding together, we get improvements in the way that that system works. Um, from an acute bout of exercise, that can be almost instantaneous. So three or four minutes of walking, we can start seeing blood sugar levels go down. If we continue doing that exercise for a long term, eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, we actually see that system start to improve. 
which is very different to how your medications will work. So oral hypoglycemics will reduce your blood sugar levels in a different way, um, and working more at how the, the sugar is released into the blood system, but it isn't a lasting effect. If you stop taking your medication, then your sugar levels will start to rise again. The chronic benefits of exercise is that system starts to improve and your body actually starts taking control of that system. Okay? If you stop exercising for a period of time, we're protected by the fact that this system takes time to go back to where it was. So if it's a week or two weeks, it's okay, because if we can re-establish that exercise plan from there, we can continue with them benefits. Whereas medication is sort of one day and I need it again the next day, or even in that same day. Um, again, some of them other chronic benefits. So if you continue, we increase our muscle mass. So we talked about the muscles being that driver of getting rid of them sugars when we're using them. If we have more muscle, we have more ability to store them sugars. So rather than storing them in our muscles, we store uh, in, in our blood system, we store it in the muscles, all right? When we exercise regularly, we also improve the circulation to that working muscle. So we increase the capacity for insulin to bind to their muscles. And again, that effect is a lasting effect. So we have bigger sized muscles and we have better transportation for that insulin to interact with that. So again, very important to, to work on building their muscles, but we know that over time our muscles do reduce. No one in this room from the age of 40, when we move to 50, when we move to 60, is as strong as we were in that previous decade. So we are fighting a bit of a, a losing battle in, return, in, in regards to strength and muscle size. But if we can implement exercise, we can maintain a lot of them losses. So I've chucked this one in because it gets people thinking about exercise and breaking down what is actually beneficial and it can be very different to what most people think. You know, if I was to throw around what people think about exercise, it's normally long walks, it's normally going to the gym, and for some people that scares the hell out of them, okay? With this study, what they did is they grabbed a bunch of type two diabetics and they fed them a standardized meal. So they fasted and they all ate the same meal. So they were able to measure how much carbohydrate they were bringing in, and they separated these people into three groups. One group got to sit not very difficult, so they weren't allowed to move. The other two groups were light walking and a simple resistance group. Now, light walking, what that was, was every 30 minutes an alarm went off and that group of people got up and walked for three minutes at 3.2 kilometres an hour, which is not very fast. So if you have a treadmill at home and you fire it up at 3.2, if you can manage that for three minutes, that's what these guys were doing. So they weren't running up hills, they weren't walking up big mountains or doing anything like that, they walked for three minutes, okay? And the resistance group, basically all they did was a combination of body weighted exercises, again, every 30 minutes, an alarm went off, and for three minutes, they did standing up and down out of their chairs, they did leg raises, they did step ups, they did wall push ups. And as long as their exercises were whole body in nature, um, and for three minutes. And what we see, a significant reduction in how high the peak in blood sugar was after eating, so that was one hour or two hours after eating. And we can see that sitting group continues to rise. These two other groups start to return much, much faster and don't reach the same level. And all they did was three minutes, okay? At this mark, they reintroduced the same meal again, so everybody was eating again. We can see the rises, but we're still maintaining that gap, so the exercise groups maintain a much lower blood sugar level, and the resistance group so standing up and down out of your chair, doing some step ups, very simple exercises were actually more effective than the light walking group. But in essence, that three minutes of either walking or gentle exercise would be quite manageable for most of my clients to manage pretty comfortably. We see the same impact on the insulin response. So the guys that were sitting had a much, much higher insulin response to that carbohydrate based meal. Again, if we're having that influx of insulin all the time, it is going to have an impact on that system. So we see a much greater reduction in the levels of insulin at that point. And again, that level is maintained as we go six, seven hours down the track. Okay. And uh, we're looking at eight hours. So we're looking at 24 minutes of exercise across that eight hour period. So we haven't even reached that 30 minutes a day, but they've done it in eight stages of three minutes. And we see the same changes with blood pressure. 
So it extends further than just that diabetic control. The blood pressure was improved um, both systolically and diastolically in both the exercise groups whilst maintaining that very simple nature. So when we talk about exercise, we tend to break it down um, into a couple of parts. So we have aerobic exercise, okay? And this is often the exercise that a lot of my clients find the most difficult because it takes time, okay? Aerobic exercise is typically greater than 90 seconds, okay? That's not a lot of time, but when we talk about going for a walk for 30 minutes, that is quite often very confronting for many clients. It's too far, it's too long, and they haven't walked 30 minutes in quite a period of time. We want to use large muscle groups, and that's going to elicit a number of different changes. That's going to get the heart system working. It's going to get the lungs working. And unfortunately for many people, it's uncomfortable. Getting that breathlessness and having that elevated heart rate can be quite uncomfortable. Now, my wife doesn't really exercise very often, and when we walk up hills, she doesn't like me anymore. Um, <laughs> when we, came down Mount, we went up Mount Lofty and I said, you're doing very well, come on. She thinks I'm being sort of... Um, having a dig at her because I'm standing at the top finding it very comfortable telling her to keep going and as the man came down the hill he said good job love you're nearly there and she said thank you very much so I tend to get the the F and ums and everyone else gets the wave and thank you for trying to support me but not absolutely but unfortunately she wouldn't get the benefit from that once she gets to the top heart rate comes down breathlessness returns she feels fine she actually feels good about what she's actually achieved at that point. So it's quite often very difficult for a client to get their head around going for a 30 minute walk and feeling quite uncomfortable. But that's where we come in to try to break down that process about how much do you actually need to start with from, from a walking perspective and then how can we improve that. So these, this could be brisk walking, it could be running, swimming, it could be playing golf. I always recommend clients to find something that they enjoy doing. So if you like dancing and you go rock and roll dancing or ballroom dancing, go for it. It's exercise. But people don't really view that as exercise. Um, they might look at it as incidental exercise, but just because it's fun doesn't mean it's not exercise. So if we can gain that social aspect and that enjoyment factor, it becomes less about the exercise and more about some of these other benefits. All right, so something that I probably bore my patients with every session is talking about step counts, okay? Now, most people would have been exposed to step counts at some point, but they have a significant impact on your health, all right? Now, this particular study, again, worked with a cohort of type 2 diabetics who were averaging around 3,000 steps. Now, 3,000 steps is probably a typical day for an office worker who's travelled to work, moved around a little bit, some of my clients who stay home will struggle to achieve 3,000 steps in a day, all right? And what they did is they encouraged these people over time to increase their average step counts, and we can see there that they went from 3,000 towards 8,000. So quite often the recommendation is that we need to achieve 10,000 steps per day as a minimum. Now these guys still didn't achieve the 10,000 steps, but if we have a look over here, what we see is significant benefits in their blood profiles. So we see HbA1c is reducing by approximately 10%. Blood glucose is similarly. Cholesterol, breaking that down in good to bad. So, uh, sorry, bad. So reductions in bad, which is good, and increases in good cholesterol, which is good as well. Okay, and the floating fats all reducing. And all they've done is increase their daily walking levels. And most of this is done incidentally. So these clients haven't been walking for 30, 40, 50 minutes in one hit. What they've done is they've done practical things. They've parked the car further away and walked for five or 10 minutes. They've got off that bus stop one stop early. When they've gone to the supermarket to get milk, they've walked up and down every aisle in order to just grab that milk. So increasing by five or 10 minutes, if we multiply that by two or three different tasks, can definitely equate to that three to 5,000 step mark. And again, we haven't even started doing any conventional exercise yet, but yet we're seeing significant improvements in the way that these clients are responding. So for me, the first task with my clients is working out, are you moving enough in your day? Because if we're not, even bringing that client into the gym once a week might not be posing the best benefit, okay? What you do every day is going to be the paramount improver. So that's what we need to look at. And we quite often work with pedometers. So we see people with activity trackers and pedometers, and maybe many of you in the room already have them. 
um, and we use them to determine how much exercise or incidental activity an individual is doing. These can be very, very primitive, so you don't have to go out and spend $400 on the most fancy heart rate sleep driven pedometer Fitbit. These pedometers can be as cheap as $10 or $15. Okay, they measure your steps, they're fairly arbitrary, you have to write it down on your diary at the end of the day, but it's pretty simple. All we want to know is how many steps are you doing and can we see an improvement in them step counts over time by thinking about some of them simple strategies. If you are more tech savvy, um, they do have apps and they give you beautiful graphs and they track everything nicely. Some of my clients, that's pretty scary and they don't want to go down that pathway, but they do pose us with really good information. Okay, when you go away and you come back and see me and ask you, how have you gone with your 10 minutes of walking per day? How are your step counts going? And if I don't see increases, then we know that we haven't really been achieving them, them goals through there. So it, it provides us with accountability and quite often um, clients enjoy seeing, going for a 10 minute walk and seeing the number of steps just tick over. So it's quite a useful and empowering tool from that perspective. There are many variables. so. Typically, 10 minutes of walking is going to achieve about 1,000 steps. So that's at a normal walking speed. So if you do walk a bit slower, then it is going to take a little bit longer. So when we multiply that out, that's 100 minutes of walking across your day. Sounds like a lot. Now, we're awake for approximately 1,000 minutes, give or take. I think it's 960 minutes after your eight hours sleep. And we need about 100 minutes of that to be active. But it doesn't have to be all at the same time. So 10 lots of 10 minutes across your day, going out to the garden, going out to the shed, walking to the letterbox, all of these small things can have a profound impact on building them step counts. And remember that any increase can definitely be positive. I quite often see that 10,000 step count and, and my clients tend to, to back away, particularly when they start recording them and they get 1,500 for the day. And in their mind, they think, how am I ever gonna get to 10,000 steps? These small strategies definitely work towards building that up and we can definitely increase. And even if we're only getting from that three to 8,000, we are still gonna get that benefit. So how much is enough? That 10,000 steps is what do we talk about? And more than 75% of Australians don't actually achieve that general recommendation of 10,000 steps per day. So it is definitely a bit of an ep epidemic and I think Society has changed a lot over time in the way that we do do things. Everything has become a little bit more simplistic. We drive everywhere. I think people have forgot at times that exercise can be fun. Going for a walk could be fun. Um, and, and many of you guys probably went dancing when you were quite young. Um, and that used to be the normal sort of shindig on a Friday night was to go out and, and go dancing and do all these things. That stuff's still there, but let's face it, they're there more to get drunk and do other things than they are actually about the, the dancing part of things. So society has definitely taken a shift and we're seeing this have a massive impact on our children. So they do estimate that around 2020, up to 50% of our children are going to be overweight or obese. And 2020 is not far away. So if you look back to when you were a child and how many kids were overweight or obese at that time, and we bring that to 2020, and we're looking at more than 50% of our children are gonna be in that position, we can imagine the ramifications that that's going to happen. And even when I started 10 years ago, a typical diabetic client was in their 50s, um, maybe even older. Now I'm seeing people in their teenage years diagnosed with type two diabetes, or in their early 20s. So we're definitely seeing much, much younger diagnoses of type two diabetes, um, which is quite confronting because they're going to be exposed to this condition for longer, which means that the, the complications that are arising from this are going to be significant. So why should you do more exercise? The step counts are definitely going to have a positive influence on your blood sugar levels, but they're probably not going to improve your strength levels and, and, and give us all the benefits that we need from exercise. So there are other reasons in terms of core stability, flexibility and mobility that we would recommend that you do other forms of exercise over and above just your 10,000 step goal. <coughs> so then we move on to resistance training. Now resistance training tends to scare people as well because they think it has to be in a gym and they have to lift heavy weights and they think about the big muscle men in their sort of sweatshirt staring at everybody and screaming. Um, but it's actually typically one of the exercises that my clients find the easiest 
because if you have breathing difficulties or a heart problem or if you have pain, going for a walk might be really difficult. <laughs> but lifting a weight 10 times and then having a rest is actually not too bad, particularly if we started at a light intensity and then build up. So it's actually a way that we can break up a gym-based session by utilising weights or giving you some goals at home that are very simple to build that strength. But there's incorporated rest periods within that strength-based or resistance-based program. So it's not overly taxing on the body until we start building them conditioning levels up and then we obviously do want to start progressing that as we go. Obviously it can be in a gym and that's where we're going to have access to much, much heavier weights. Um, at home we are limited by what the client has or what the client's prepared to go out and, and look at in terms of purchasing. But daily activity li lifting, chair stands out in the garden, all these things are beneficial. Um, it can be body weighted exercises, dumbbells and therabands, you know, we, we send people to Kmart, therabands are as cheap as five bucks and even your dumbbells you can buy for five or ten dollars these days so um, everything is becoming a lot, lot more accessible. So why do we want to look at strength training? Um, if we go back to when we talked about them muscles, if we have a look here, this is a 40-year-old male. Basically, that's a leg of ham. They've taken a cross-section through this person's leg. And this is the muscle structure in through here, the bone in the middle, and the level, layer of fat around the outside. Okay. Over time, this person was a triathlete. Over time, we see reductions in strength. Okay. Now, this gentleman here is a 74-year-old sedentary person, and you can see the wasting here of their muscle structures and then the fat levels surrounding that. And this gentleman down here was a 70-year-old triathlete, so you can see the differences between the two and imagine the physiological adaptations and benefits that the 70-year-old who's been active most of his life is having versus this one here. Now, we can still get benefits with this gentleman here, but we're not going to get to the same levels as if we are to maintain these strength levels. So that's where that prevention comes in. Prevention is much better than cure. So if we can curb that reduction in strength, we are going to have much better positive influences based on that. So a loss of muscle mass can reduce the effectiveness of that insulin to clear. There's just less muscle. We can't store it. We can't store that sugar in the muscle that's not there anymore. So it is going to have a significant impact on that. Um, it's also going to have an impact on, I guess, your balance and your stability. So if that starts to lead to falls and other concerns, that's going to have a significant impact on that client's ability to walk um, and their confidence to do other exercises as well. So we start to see that spiral of deconditioning occur at that point and we start doing less and less and less and sugar levels do start to become a little bit less controlled. This graph here fairly simply suggests or shows that sarcopenia or that reduction in muscle size and strength that we see over time. So typically between that age of 30 to 40, we are at our strongest. Um, unfortunately for the ladies, I can put the argument to bed that men are definitely stronger than women, um, but more so from the fact that they have greater numbers and size in terms of muscle fibers. If we actually take a sample of the muscle from each of them, they're identical. So it's just that men have more muscle than women but what we see is a significant decline over time in the grip strength in both male and female parties. And what are we seeing here? So 50 to 59 age group of a female grip strength of 30 and a male around 50. Quite often in my clinic, I'll see levels of about 14 or 15 and the men will be similarly half of what's recommended. So we're already seeing this negative benefit um, of what's occurring in terms of that now, in terms of strength-based training, this study here, and it's a little bit old, but I like it because it, it, it's really, really simple to follow. These guys did a simple resistance-based program. It was a clinic-based program, two to three times a week, where they were doing eight to 10 strength-based lifts, um, three to 10 repetitions, and they were lifting quite firm weights. It was a, a fairly long study, so it went for two years, and they tracked how these clients went in terms of their strength, um, four, four or five different movements, so a leg press, some lifting exercises. And what we see, which is good, over the course of 12 months, everything starts to increase. Then all of a sudden, everything starts to decline. Um, and I normally pose the question as to why people think that there would be such a decline um, in that strength. And the typical answer is, 
52 weeks in a year, it's now Christmas. <laughs> that, program, that program stopped for that four to six weeks over that Christmas break. And what do we see? Slow decline in the strength. Over that four week period though, we didn't return to baseline. So it wasn't a complete waste of time. You know, that four weeks definitely had an impact. So when these clients come back to the gym and I see it every day, I've been away for three weeks, man, I really feel my session today. It's, it, it feels quite hard. Two weeks later, they're back to normal. So what we see is that we do get a decline. So adherence is obviously really, really important when we look at this exercise. Um, but we do see improvements over time. So how to get improvements if, if we're looking at resistance training, what's practical? We would recommend at least two sessions per week. Okay, so eight to 10 strength exercises, 10 to 15 repeats, and we do need to lift quite firm weights when we're working with them. If it's at home, typically the weights reduce because we don't have access to them, but we can increase the amount of times that we do do this. So if we're doing this three or four times a week at home, and we can still either maintain the benefits of a short clinic-based program, or we can improve benefits as well from that. So in summary, from an exercise perspective, a combination of that strength and aerobic exercise is really, really important. We can get many metabolic impacts from our exercise. It's not just reductions in blood sugar levels. And as we already went through, most people have more than one co comorbidity at the same time. So if we're gaining multiple benefits across systems, um, then it's definitely improving our function. So that regular sustained physical activity can reduce that HbA1c up to that 1% level. And we saw earlier that graph that showed the reduction in comorbidities or risk factors when we get that 1% risk factor. So what are the typical guidelines currently in terms of exercise? It's a little bit more than general. So the general recommendations for exercise is 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. When we look at a diabetic population, it increases. So we're looking at 210 minutes of exercise across a week. So that equates to seven lots of 30 minutes. So if we're able to do a 30 minute walk every day or some combination of is where we're going to see them benefits over time. If we wanna promote weight loss, the number increases again. So we're looking at people doing greater than 250 minutes a week of exercise. And, and, and it's not uncommon for me to see somebody in my clinic who's doing zero. So no exercise at all from a structured perspective during the week. So just building them levels is fundamentally quite important. So if we're going from zero towards 100, then we're definitely working towards them benefits as we go. If we can increase the intensity, the duration of exercise we do can reduce. So if you can work really, really hard and for short bouts of exercise as well, then that will, will reduce that, that that length of time exercising. And we recommend two resistance training sessions per week as well. And then resistance-based training sessions do count in that 210 minutes. So if you spend 30 minutes exercising at a gym, that counts towards that 210 minute goal. So clients that are walking three to four to five times a week, plus two gym sessions, quite often will tick off that 210 minute um, of exercise per week. Um, in terms of strength, we recommend not more than two consecutive days. Um, but also with your walking, you know, we want it to be regular. One study I was reading suggested that the 30 minutes every day, but it also looked into the effectiveness of one hour. If you double the dose, do you double the benefit? And the answer was no. But what it found out that you could actually go for a walk for one hour every second day and achieve the same benefits as going for a walk every day for 30 minutes. Now that's particularly important for people who are working and don't necessarily have the time to do exercise every day. If they can do a little bit more every second day, we still get similar benefits. So we know there are a lot of barriers towards exercise and determining what these are uh, are fundamentally important. So too busy, cost, injury, pain and problems, um, transportation, hot, wet, you know, I normally hear every sort of issue um, that comes up. The dog ate my homework doesn't often come up, um, but I've heard some very interesting reasons as to why we wouldn't exercise. Um, but we need to break down them barriers and that's where we come in. So some of them can be insecurities. So whether there are underlying chronic issues, which is impacting confidence, 
Um, fear and avoidance, which leads to further deconditioning, which does make these issues more difficult. Um, a lot of my clients will say I'm too old, too old to exercise, you know, my, my good days are gone, I can't get any benefit. And the research is pretty poignant in the fact that it suggests that it's never too late to start exercising. And even if it is simplistic in nature, we're still going to get benefit. And what's high intensity to me will be very different to what's high intensity to an individual who's not doing exercise. So they can still achieve really good levels, even if that seems like it's simplistic. So I would always recommend starting on that general activity. You know, if you don't have a pedometer activity tracker, have a look at something like that and start recording that and start working on the days where you're most efficient. So if you've got 8,000 steps for four days and for one reason or another that one day is 2,000, that would be the day that I would, uh, would target your exercise to be on the day where you're not doing as much exercise. Um, and the lifestyle changes definitely make an, a massive improvement, so parking that car further away. So very simple strategies to work through there. Setting achievable goals I think is really, really important. Clients often come to me with goals that are somewhat unrealistic, um, particularly when it comes to weight loss. Um, they often quote me numbers that were when they were 18 years old and they haven't been to that level for a long, long time. Or their time frames, you know, I want to lose 20 or 30 kilos in the next six months. So they're really just setting themselves up for failure. And if we don't address that in the short term, we're not really going to succeed as we go through. All right. I'll skip through that. So we know that that adherence is specifically important, and that's where the EPs sort of come in at, in that respect. So I think we've got a couple of minutes. What time was this? A couple of minutes. So I'll just quickly go through some of them precautions. So with hypoglycemia, we do tend to see this with insulin-dependent diabetics more so than our oral hypoglycemics. But if your blood sugar levels are at 5.5 and you're about to go into exercise, we would typically recommend you bring on a small snack to try to avoid that hypoglycemic effect that we're going to expect to occur. It's not overly comfortable and you're walking down the street and you're having a hypo. Most people will think that you're drunk and just leave you there rather than actually give you some help. Um, avoiding insulin peaks is quite important as well. So if you do take insulin, particularly rapid insulin, um, avoiding that 60 to 90 minutes immediately after usage because that's when your insulin is going to be doing its most effective work. And if you add exercise on top of that, we're getting a double positive and it will typically lead to hypo type issues. So we can strategically add that exercise in to one, get the benefit from the insulin and then to utilize exercise at a later date to continue with that process. Um, hyperglycemia, so if the sugars are too high, that can cause some complications at the same time. Um, so we do modify or take more caution when, when sugar levels are 17 or above, particularly if ketones are present, it can increase the risk of diabetic coma. So there are some precautions that we do need to take. Peripheral neuropathy, so if we do have issues with our feet and we're not sensating our feet very well, that can lead to falls and other issues, particularly with balance but it can also lead to blisters and ulcerations that we might not feel. So if we're walking for long periods of time and we can't really feel what's going on in our feet, that could lead to significant problems and infection down the track. So we do want to avoid these things. So foot care is always recommended when we're looking at these exercise programs. And blood pressure, so modifying or suspending if we're at 170 or over 110. Typically in the clinic, we can modify that and we can control it better. But when you're at home, it's pretty safe to try to avoid your exercise if your blood pressure is too, too high. Typically, we will see an increase in blood pressure when you start exercising, so we don't want to see that creeping up any further. Um, but then we will see a hypotensive effect. So in clinic, when we're modifying it and measuring, it's quite safe. But at home, we do need to be careful. I'll skip through some of them. So basically, in terms of what you would expect when you see an EP, Okay, they're going to go through an initial consultation with you and they're going to go through your medical history, any of your feelings, thoughts in terms of exercise, what are you currently doing, what's been working and what hasn't working. And work out what you like and what you don't like and based on these things, try to develop a plan that's going to work for you. Okay. We typically roll through assessment measures, so we want to look at your height, your weight, your waist measures. We want to know what your HPA levels are, how much insulin you're taking. All of these things become important because as we move forward down the track, we want to see if the intervention is actually having a positive influence on what we're doing. 
Obviously, we go into the prescription, so that can range from as little as three minutes of walking a day to coming into the gym three times a week. So it is really going to depend on the client as to what we decide to do, um, and it's quite often going to be something that the client is going to be, you know, enjoy doing, or at least be open to work towards that. And obviously, we're also there for longer-term reviews. So once we set these plans. We want you to come back, have a look if they're working. If they're not working, why aren't they working? Um, have we given you too much? Have we not given you enough exercise? Um, and how can we develop strategies to improve that moving forward? So this was a client that we've been seeing fairly long term, so 2010. Now we can see with this client, uh, they've been coming to the gym once a week. They've been utilising some services with Medicare every calendar year. And we can see that this person's reduced weight not by a huge amount, it's four kilos, which is still good, but they've been able to maintain that over that period of time. But more importantly, they've significantly improved their fitness from a measure of 15, which is really quite low from a fitness perspective, up to 25, um, which is a huge, huge improvement. Typically, we recommend about a 15 to 30% improvement with structured exercise, and this person has gone well and above that. We can also see improvements with their strength, both upper body and lower body as well. So you can imagine the functional benefits moving forward, not only in their diabetes, but in their day-to-day -day life. So how do you go about accessing EP and even dietitians um, to aid you with that? So Medicare do provide some limited services for people to access um, under the Enhanced Primary Care Plan, and that'll give you access to five sessions with an allied health professional. Now you can split them up and see an EP, a dietitian, a diabetes educator, and get a multitude of knowledge. In regards to further um, services, type 2 diabetics um, are actually entitled to another program with that, which is this eight-week diabetes group sessions. What that allows us to do is to run an assessment and then to actually come into the gym for eight sessions and actually do some exercise. Now, for anybody who's starting out, that's a great way to start because it allows us to work through that eight-week program, building that exercise plan with the information that you're giving us from a week-to-week -week perspective. So that's a really positive way to get started. And I find that many people, almost 50% of people, continue on with their exercises after they've accessed them services. Um, we see veterans as well. So if you do have Department of Vets, we can see you funded through that privately as well, so if you can't get a referral from your doctor, we can see you in a private setting and utilise your private health. So you do have a multitude of options. Um, most recently as well, we've got the NDIS system, so anybody that does have funding through that process can also gain access to exercise physiology as well. So we see work cover guys as well. So in terms of our clinics, we have four clinics across the metropolitan area. So we've got the western suburbs on Port Road, we're in Tea Tree Plaza, and we've got a clinic down in Norlunga, and then one also in Edwardstown. So we do cover a fairly broad metropolitan sort of area. So, all right. And I do have some information and brochures and things outside if you do want to have a look at them. Um, other than that, thank you.